Today I'm going to talk about uh, CECOM as a business model addressing uh, sustainable development in general with a special emphasis on education for sustainable development as well. So uh, let me start by okay. addressing the uh, challenges that we are facing today in the 21st century. So we have uh, many challenges, challenges when it comes to ecology, like resources are uh, limited and uh, in uh, a way or another, uh, I would say that uh, people, they are uh, abusing the resources a little bit and that's because of companies or marketeers which I am one of them, because my main discipline is marketing, they are offering people uh, products that people they don't really need. And it may happen that these people, they uh, could want these products, but not essentially need them. So there is a little dilemma here. How? we should create consumers or we should deliver the messages to people that they only consume what they are essentially needed to consume. So this is one challenge and it is very much related to the idea of uh, the limitation of resources and the idea of polluting the environment as well. Another challenge has to do with uh, people little bit being individualistic and not that much into being uh, participating in the community, which is uh, another dimension if we want to address sustainable development because we need always to contribute positively to the community and to the society. Another important point, very much related to education, institutions that are uh, delivering education, they are very much into conventional education and they are neglecting the ESD or the Education for Sustainable Development. The economy is being capitalizing very much into technology, investing into technology, having research and, depart and development departments very much into financing technology and not investing on human beings, not investing on human being real needs. So this is another dimension. What happened is that Dr. Ibrahim Abu Laish, who passed away in 2017, he was living in Austria and he visited Egypt in 1977 with his family and by that time he realized that Egypt is very much deteriorating after the uh, war that uh, occurred between Egypt and Israel in 1973. So he pointed the scene as Egypt should be very much better than the situation that he found in 1977. And he thought of having a new business model, which is uh, a business model that is capitalizing, investing on people. And he addressed the vision of this business model, which is SICAM as such, sustainable development towards a future where every human being can unfold his or her individual potential where mankind is living in social forms reflecting human dignity and where all economic activity is conducted in accordance with ecological and ethical principles. And in order to start realizing this vision, he decided to go to the desert and to reclaim the desert. So that was the scene in 1977 a desert land 
and he envisioned the desert as such as it is displayed in this picture now. And he decided that I am going to reclaim the desert land. I'm not using traditional conventional agriculture, but I'm going to use even organic agriculture. People by that time, they told him that this is a miracle and you cannot do it. And you cannot do it by any means. So he decided to do it, but he realized that he cannot do it alone. So he started to, to have a community and the community started very small, like this circle that is composed of a very small number of people. But it turned out these days to be a huge community. And from this perspective, I would say that he started as well to embed the idea of being collectivistic, not individualistic, as I presented in the first session, in the first slide of the session. Because no one can do anything alone. And he is very much convinced that by participating together, we can do something together. And the community that he developed, which is the Sikkim community, uh, is very much connected to each other, to the extent that every day at 9 o'clock in the morning, they, they do gather at this circle, and they start to say some pronouncing, or to pronounce, I mean, some motivational uh, quotes that uh, are very much inspiring to them all over the day. So yes, the community started to be big, larger and larger. And even uh, Dr. Abu Laish was intending to do the organic agriculture to reclaim the land. But it happened that it went even deeper by addressing the biodynamic agriculture, not the organic agriculture only. In a sense that it applies holistic understanding of life process, treats soils, fertility, plant growth, and livestock care as ecologically interrelated tasks, emphasizing spiritual and cosmic perspectives, particularly the spiritual side, because Egyptian farmers, they are very much into the spiritual dimension. So even the, the dream, uh, I would say that it didn't uh, come true only, but also it went further, one, one step further, which is addressing the biodynamic agriculture. Compost, yes, in Sikkim, we are depending on our compost. So, which means that the animal manures are the main source of the, of the compost. The wastes, we use it by recycling it in order to create our original organic compost. In 1977, of course, we were the pioneers, the first movers to do that in Sikkim. Uh, nowadays, there are some farms they are maintaining the same method. But if we return back like more than 40 years ago, we should highlight that Sikkim was the uh, uh, first mover to depend on its own internal compost cycle. Water. In Sikkim, we depend on three main sources of water. The groundwater or the well water, the government distributed uh, water, and in addition to the Nile water. So we have the, uh, the three sources, or I would say that we have what it takes in order to, to have our own, our own water uh, that we are using in the uh, agriculture. Okay, imagine with me that in 1991, the Egyptian government was uh, using pesticides for the uh, cotton, and it was using 35,000 tons annually. Dr. Abu Laish convinced the government that using the chemicals and the pesticides is very much into uh, harming the environment 
and the climate, one of the main reasons for the climate change. Imagine that he was talking about the climate change in 1977, and he convinced the government to reduce using the pesticides from 35,000 tons to 3,000 tons. You cannot imagine, of course, the bureaucracy in the Egyptian government to convince them to take such an initiative, so it is a miracle. We are not doing all that alone, as I told you at the beginning of my presentation. We cannot do what I am uh, delivering now alone. We have partners, but we do not address them as business partners. We address them as SICAM friends. And most of them, they are located in Europe. Uh, either these different institutions or other even academic institutions that I'm going to refer to some of them later in my presentation, but these are very much related to the, to the business model as, as one holistic unit. We have in SICAM different clusters. So we have the, the schools, regular schools for regular students, and we have vocational schools that we depend on their output in order to, to use their output as inputs for the other clusters or the other companies. So we have companies as well. And we have a university and you have a school for, for special needs, for students of special needs. And we have another school for students that their families are very much into preventing them from going to schools in order to send them to work and to earn money. So we have this school that encourages these students to come and to educate and to work as farmers. And by working, they are earning money and the money that they are earning, they are providing to their families. So that's how their families are keeping them in these schools. So we have different strategic business units or different clusters that are considered to be feeding industries to each other. But we need revenue in order to operate. And that's why I have here a slide that is addressing the revenue from the perspective of the economy of love. Love not from the dimension of, uh, of kissing and hugging, of course, but love from the dimension of that we are completing each other. We are not aiming to generate a high profit margin, but we are aiming to generate sufficient revenue in order to ensure the continuity of the business model. So we have different companies, number of companies, like nine companies, that they are all addressing the sustainable development from the organic perspective, either the agriculture or the pharmaceutical, but we depend on herbs, not on chemicals, or disease for organic products, which is mainly providing juices and other snacks. All of them are, are organic. A living and learning community. In SICAM, I would say that uh, regardless of the amount of efforts that we are doing every day, we don't feel exhausted because we have the love story between ourselves as employees and between SICAM. So it's not like being going to the work from 8.30 to 5. No, it's going to home. So I'm happy when I am going to seek him, exactly like I'm happy when I am going back home. So yes, Dr. Abulaish succeeded in uh, embedding this spirit and all employees are very much into what they are doing to the extent that even in the Seacom farm, they meet not every day at 9 a.m. only, but in Thursday, which is the starting day of the weekend because our weekend starts on Friday and Saturday. So on, on in Thursday, 4.30, when they finish their working hours, they meet again in order just to close the week. So just imagine with me the spirit that they have. Uh, unfolding people potential. Art is the main source of unfolding people potential. Because I cannot talk about sustainable development and I cannot talk about the environment if people are stressed. So we are very much into, into arts. And that's why we do have two celebrations, annual celebrations in SICAM. 
One of them is in the autumn, which is the birthday of, uh, of Sikkim, and the other one is in the spring, and the spring is the birthday of Dr. Abul Aish. And I have a video that we are going to see after a while by the end of my presentation that is highlighting on one of these uh, festivals, the spring one. So yes, art is very important. And when I come now to address education for sustainable development that you are delivering in Heliopolis University, you are going to recognize that we do have a special program for arts. Because I, as I said, I cannot or we cannot teach ESD, Education for Sustainable Development, without the artistic angle. If someone in SICAM is not performing well, this is not the area of improvement of this individual, but it is our role. We should place people in their appropriate places if they are not performing well, so this means that we did not do our homework. We did not place them from the very early beginning in the place that they should be placed in. So this is the idea of unfolding people's potential. Myself, as the Dean of the Faculty of Business, I'm the Acting Dean of the Faculty of Business at Heliopolis University, and I have a number of uh, colleagues that we are working together. So I'm not bossing them around, we are working together. We are chairing together. We are taking decisions together. But if I figured out that someone is not performing according to my expectations, this is not the fault of this guy. It is my homework. It is my mistake. I should reconsider the assignments that he or she are handling, and I should put him or her in the appropriate place. That suits their qualifications. So this is the mindset. Vocational Training Center providing many products. These products that the Vocational Training Center is providing, uh, regardless that we are selling them in the market, but mainly the core idea behind the Vocational Training Center is to produce outputs that we are using in the other clusters. So companies, they are using their furniture, for example. The university is depending on their supplies and so on. So see, the output is being capitalized on as inputs for other entities or other strategic business units in SICM. It's like a mechanism, an engine that is operating depending on some gears that they are all together holistically, they produce the final value. And this is the school for uh, uh, special education or the special needs. They do participate in many exhibitions. They are very excited about what they are doing, and they are participating by doing arts as well in the Seacombs Festival. So this is very much uh, inspiring to them and inspiring to us as well. And it is addressing unfolding people's potential. We have the medical center. The medical center is very much delivering high quality services to the Seacom community with very subsidized prices. I can say even for, for free because it is really subsidized and the service is really of high, of high quality. Yes, let me now start the holistic education. The education for sustainable development cannot be delivered without, without arts. So in the schools of SICAM, we depend on arts in whichever, any type of school. In the university, we do have a special program, which is the core program, that is mainly addressing arts. Arts as music, arts as movement, movement as dancing, I mean, hear with me. I don't know if you if you hear about you with me before, but it is a special uh, artistic dimension. And poem and Arabic literature. And any students in whichever any faculty in Heliopolis University is obliged to take the core program. Within the core program, we have some elective courses in order not, not to be that pushy to the students. But even the elective courses are addressing the, the arts. 
again, we cannot do sustainable development without being relieved from any pressure. So we are relieving ourselves as employees or instructors or professors, and at the same time, we are relieving our students from pressure. Students, they do, they do what, they do resist the core program when initially they come to the university. Because some of them, they are studying pharmacy, others are studying uh, engineering or business or organic agriculture. So arts is not part of their specialization. So they resist it at the beginning, but you cannot imagine how do they perceive it when they are graduates. So we do have now a number of alumni and they really appreciate the core program and the arts and they uh, indicate uh, explicitly that arts changed their personality. So we are very much into building people's personalities as well. Okay, education for sustainable development. See this picture? The householder here is taking the uh, picture for his family members and he doesn't care whatsoever about the garbage surrounding the picture. So this is the traditional education, taking into consideration only the idea of delivering the message, delivering the education without considering the environment or the entire globe. But education for sustainable development is of course, visualizing the family members and at the same time, considering the waste and considering the, the garbage from the holistic perspective. So yes, if we are addressing education, we should address it from the holistic dimension, not to consider only the idea of delivering education, but what is the environment? What is, or what are the circumstances that are surrounding the, the education? Okay. And as such, we want to, to address this dilemma, which is declining resources, rising demand, and there is a conflict that cannot be resolved without sustainability. So this is the sustainability funnel. And in order to generate new generations that uh, are not that much into being demanding and at the same time they are very much into appreciating the scarcity of resources we need to address sustainability from the perspective of education for sustainable development so we have here rising population global trade technology affluence declining water biodiversity forests soil and they are creating a conflict. We want to generate new generations that are very much appreciating the idea of sustainability. So that's why we are addressing it from the frugality aspect. Frugality and sustainable development, particularly in the business school. But let alone, of course, the pharmacy, let alone the uh, organic agriculture faculties, let alone the engineering. Uh, all of them, they are addressing it from the perspective of frugality. Frugality. I want to deliver it from the point of view of simplicity. Being simple is being good as well. Why not we offer our people products that are really needed, essentially needed, with moderate quality. I'm not saying with very high quality, with moderate quality, but with very low prices. So this is frugal innovation. And frugal innovation, in order to practice it, you need to appreciate it. And you won't appreciate it unless you study sustainable development. So yes. We want to generate frugal consumers. We want to have frugal alumni. If we have frugal alumni and frugal consumers, 
we will be on the right track addressing sustainability and sustainable development. Frugality and sustainable development is a lifestyle that you need to, to understand it and then you practice it by yourself in your daily life practices. And education for sustainable development is the path. But <coughs> when I am talking about education for sustainable development, even we have two dimensions, traditional education for sustainable development and innovative education for sustainable development. I'm very much into, of course, innovative education for sustainable development because it results into perfect outcomes like that. Addressing the challenges that I started the session with from a holistic perspective, not separating them as standalone or as separate islands. No, they should be taken into consideration collectively. Interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. Interdisciplinary is combining sciences together. Multidisciplinary is generating new fields of study. So education for sustainable development, like the core program, when you have students coming from different faculties, engineering, uh, uh, business, engin and uh, pharmacy, sitting together in the same classroom, and the discussion starts between them and between the instructor, then what will happen is that the instructor may identify a certain research area that he or she they did not consider before, which is generating a new field of study. This is the multidisciplinary. You cannot have education for sustainable development as a separate subject. You must have it embedded in all curricula. And to address it from the local and global perspective or the local and the global challenges. Like, uh, like sometimes it is a myth for some people to understand that the climate change is a reality. Not all people, they are within this frame of reference. So there are many challenges that you need to take into account when you're addressing such new area. Uh, of course, needless to say that we should envision the change that happened in the past and what are we living now as present and the future, like for example, when I say frugality, frugality is very much against the idea of global branding. So just imagine with me, what will the global companies or the multinational companies will perceive frugality? Although they started, of course, to perceive it very positively. We have many examples, BMW started to use uh, very light uh, material in order to reduce the weight of, of the vehicles. Many, many, many examples that started to, to address frugality. And there is a sustainable development competitive index, by the way, that is taking place these days. And companies, they are very much into being placed in the high ranks of this uh, sustainability competition index. Achieving transformation in being an educator, pedagogy, and the educational systems. As an example, in Heliopolis University, you are hiring professors that they did not hear about education for sustainable development before. So it is our role to have like weekly meetings, and that's exactly what is happening, in order to discuss with them the new themes of education for sustainable development. Some of them, they resist it because you know that professors, they know it all, but others, they are welcoming the idea. And, and, and education for sustainable development is totally far away from the mindset of I know it all, because no one knows it all, even in the traditional disciplines that we are in. I do not know it all in marketing or in business. I'm always learning. And frankly speaking, I'm learning more from my students, not from the published texts. Because these students, they raise questions that, that never crossed my mind before. So I go and search for, for the question that they raise, so I start to learn. So yes, this mindset should be the norm if we are serious in education for sustainable development. But seriousness, not from the traditional perspective as addressing education for sustainable development as a standalone separate subject within the curricula. No. If we are addressing it, then we are very traditional. 
we should make sure that it is the core of the curricula. Like in any field of study, in any subject, we have the background of sustainable development. In any subject, statistics even. But when I say so to the statistics professors, they say, how come, are you kidding us? How come statistics and uh, sustainable development, they don't go hand in hand? No, they go. If you use examples or problems when you are delivering the statistical theory, but this problem or this example is rooted on sustainable development. So it works in any subject, in even languages, it works. So it should be as a core, not as a separate standalone subject. ESD best practices in Egypt. Let me talk a little bit about the best practices of ESD of Education for Sustainable Development in Egypt. We have many partners that we are working with when it comes to embedding ESD into the curricula. These partners are mainly from uh, Europe. So we have a number of projects that are been financed by the European Union or the Erasmus Plus projects or program. Previously, it was named the Tampus Office. This project, which is Education for Sustainable Development, is very catchy. Why? Imagine that we went to schools, schools, not universities. And in Egypt, as I mentioned before, the system is really bureaucratic. So we didn't aim to change the schooling curricula because it is out of the question, we won't be able to do that. But we studied the current traditional schooling curricula. And we did not change it. But we provided examples and we provided hands-on activities that students, they do in order to address the education for sustainable development. I'm going to give you a, a quick example of, of the practical exercises that we, that we used in order to uh, supplement the traditional curricula with the sustainable development theme. Like we have a number of uh, students in the classroom, usually in public schools, the number of students is very high. Very high, which means very high. I am talking about 100 students in a classroom in some areas, 100 students. So imagine 100 students, the teacher should catch their attention. They need a celebrity, not a teacher. So what we did, as an example, of course, having some beans and we hide the beans in the classroom and we divide the students into groups and the groups they go out of the classroom and then we start to invite group the first group so the first group come and we tell the first group that there are some beans being hidden in the classroom and they start to to search for the beans we ask them to go and search for the beans so they they get the beans and there are other places that the beans are hidden in. So we invite the second group and they start to, to search for the beans. And then we invite the third group and then the fourth group. And then the beans, they disappear. The beans are the resources and the groups are the generations. So we tell them that, see, the first comer or the first comers, they are consuming your resources. So you need to be very careful when you consume your resources. So I delivered the message. I did not change the curricula because the curricula has the resources, but in a very conventional way. So I delivered it in a very interesting way to the students. This project is called the Edu Camp One project. It was very successful. And then we had the Edu Camp Two project, which is going to two governorates. And we implemented the same idea, the same project, but precisely in these two areas, in these two governorates. And then we went to EduCamp 3, which is going to particular schools in slum areas and reinventing the entire school, the infrastructure of the school, and also employing the toolkits, the activities toolkits within the entire school's curricula. And this was financed by the GIZ or the German uh, government and it was very successful as well. 
we have another project that it's called, it is uh, expired already. It's called the RUCAS, Reorient University Curricula to Address Sustainability, which is addressing, so revising the traditional curricula from the different participating universities. We, and of course, embedding the sustainable development themes in this curriculum. We had partners from the region, from Lebanon, from Jordan. Uh, we have European partners as well, from Germany, from uh, Austria, from Greece. And uh, this is a real example of not being able to do it alone. We need people to, to collaborate together in order to do what we are, what we are doing. Another campus or Erasmus Plus uh, program, which is called the uh, CLIMASP, Development of an Interdisciplinary Program in Climate Change and Sustainability Policy. This is very beautiful because this one, this program, is offering the undergraduate students in the participating universities a diploma. So imagine you are an undergraduate student and you receive a diploma as a minor, as an additional minor. So assu assuming that someone is studying pharmacy, and at the same time has a minor or a diploma in climate change. Perfect. Addressing interdisciplinary orientation or multidisciplinary orientation in its deep, deepest sense. And we have another project, which is the TechSAFS, Climate Change, Sustainability, Agriculture, and Food Security. This is a master program that is offering a master degree for organic agriculture. We have organic agriculture faculty in Heliopolis University, but it is very recently established, so we cannot offer uh, postgraduate studies yet unless we have our first intake as alumni. So we are offering this uh, master program through one of the public universities in Egypt that is already established since a long time. But our role as Heliopolis University, is based on Seacamp's experience, is to write the curricula, write the curricula of the master program, because we have what it takes when it comes to knowledge, of course, through capitalizing on the Seacamp uh, uh, business model in agriculture. And this is a beautiful project that will start in February. The kickoff meeting will take place in. Uh, in Cyprus in February. Here, we are addressing sustainable development from a regional perspective, because in Egypt we have many Syrians as refugees. And these Syrians, they are uh, being enrolled in informal education systems. They are registered formally in the Egyptian public school systems, but they do not go. They go to their centers which are considered to be the informal educational system for the Syrian community. So this project is based on getting their teachers, that they are teaching them in these centers, because it is a fact. They don't go to the public schools in Egypt. They go to these centers, so it is a fact. So we are getting the teachers that they are teaching them, and they are Syrian teachers as well. Some of them are Egyptians, and we educate them on the appropriate methodology to use. Either this appropriate methodology is a regular ongoing business as usual methodology or a methodology that is not or, I would say, and or the methodology for education for sustainable development.